It was five weeks ago when three anti-apartheid activists escaped from detention in South Africa and holed up at the U.S. consulate in Johannesburg. Well, today they emerged, vowing to resume their opposition to the white minority government of that country. They said they took refuge in the consulate to draw attention to others detained without charge in South Africa. The government says that they will not be arrested again. They were cheered by supporters who chanted the Zulu word for power. Authorities in Oregon charged today that children at a religious commune were forced to watch as one of their young friends was beaten to death. The commune was promoted as a sports training camp, but as NBC's David Burrington reports tonight, it appears to have been little more than a concentration camp. It was called the Ecclesia Athletic Association, based in the Los Angeles ghetto of Watts, but with a training center on an Oregon farm. We have a purpose. The group's leader said he wanted to train youngsters for the Olympics. Man, when you're from Watts and you're on the bottom of the rung anyway, you better shoot high. You might as well shoot high. But last Friday night, authorities placed 55 hungry, frightened youngsters from the farm under protective custody. After it was discovered that an eight-year-old girl had been killed, she'd been whipped and beaten to death, she was Dana Broussard, daughter of the group's founder. The youngsters had been living in this house with four bedrooms and only one bathroom. They'd slept on the floor, no furniture. The children told authorities they'd been frequently whipped and beaten. All were forced to watch as the young girl was flogged to death. The beating was uh, normally extensive in nature, in public, in the sense that the kids were to maintain a count and observe it occurring. Four adults from the commune were charged with manslaughter. Eldridge Broussard was not there when the killing occurred but he'd always said that strong discipline was part of his routine. Parents who turned their children over to Broussard gave him total allegiance. So far, none has talked to newsmen, but the grandmother of one child said she'd always feared something like this would happen. My daughter's aware that this type of disciplining was going on because she so much has admitted it, and uh, that's what I don't understand. Neighbors of the commune were uneasy last year when they saw the youngsters standing at attention for hours at a time. A year ago, we predicted the potential for something like this to happen. They asked county officials to investigate, but nothing was done. Authorities now say they'll keep the children in protective custody indefinitely. David Burrington, NBC News. Actress Robin Gibbons said today she doesn't want a dime from heavyweight champion Mike Tyson. She will give him the divorce he wants, she said, after eight months of marriage, without taking anything. The champion's assets could be worth as much as 20 to 50 million dollars. Through her lawyer, Gibbons said she never wanted anything except what was best for Michael. <laughs> Political polls out tonight show George Bush with a smaller lead over Michael Dukakis. A nationwide Harris poll gives Bush a nine-point lead. An ABC poll shows Bush up by seven points. Other earlier polls had Bush in double digits. Today, Dukakis tried to close the gap by responding to Bush charges that he is soft on crime and weak on defense. NBC's Chris Wallace reports tonight on the Democratic counterattack. Democrats have been saying for weeks the Republicans' negative campaign is destroying Michael Dukakis and have urged him to fight back. Today, in unusually blunt terms, he did just that. Friends, this is garbage. This is political garbage. Dukakis was referring to the latest Republican attack on prison furloughs, a flyer the Illinois State Party is sending voters that says a local mass murderer would be eligible for weekend passes in Massachusetts. Dukakis accused the Bush campaign of exploiting the case of Willie Horton, a Massachusetts prisoner who brutalized a couple while on furlough. Yes, it was a terrible human tragedy, and I accepted responsibility for it and changed the program. And the candidate noted there have been other murders by prisoners on furlough. In California, when Ronald Reagan was governor, and last year by a federal prisoner. I would never use that kind of human tragedy to accuse the president of being soft on crime. And maybe that's a fundamental difference between me and George Bush. But while Dukakis was responding to one attack, Bush was launching another one. A commercial run last night during the World Series charges Dukakis has opposed almost every new weapon system. And now he wants to be our commander in chief. America 
can't afford that risk. While Dukakis has said deployment of new systems could be affected by negotiations with the Soviets, he supports a number of weapons Bush accuses him of opposing. Today, running mate Lloyd Benson called the commercial a gross distortion. And when they say he's against the stealth bomber, not true. When they say he's against modernization of the tribe, not true. Still, the Democrats realize their message is being drowned out by these attacks. And they are considering buying television time next week for Dukakis himself to try to set the record straight. Chris Wallace, NBC News, with the Dukakis campaign in Illinois. The vice president continues uh, his attacks on Dukakis today while campaigning in Michigan. Stumping with former President Gerald Ford, Bush accused Dukakis of having an unrealistic view of America's role in the world and a naive approach to the Soviets. Bush also called for Congress to cooperate with the White House in a return to a bipartisan foreign policy. An unfounded rumor that the Washington Post tomorrow would publish a potentially damaging story about Bush was blamed in part for a 22-point drop in the stock market today, the first anniversary of the Black Monday collapse. Well, in his commentary tonight, John Chancellor takes a look at the impact of what happened a year ago. John? On Wall Street today, a bumper sticker was on sale which read, I survived the crash of 87, but I used to drive a Mercedes. The public's response to that seems to be, who cares? There was no widespread sympathy for the Mercedes crowd that took a beating a year ago when the markets fell apart. The crash did catch the country's attention. Everyone heard the predictions of recession or depression, but there's been no recession, and most Americans weren't hurt. The economy is in its 71st month of continued growth. Polls show that people are generally optimistic about their personal finances. So did anything really happen when the markets collapsed a year ago? I think so. I think Black Monday and what happened after liberated us from an American myth. Most of us have grown up listening to scary stories about the crash of 1929 and the depression that followed. We were programmed to believe that a big stock market crash would lead to a big economic downturn. The crash became part of mythology. Not many stockbrokers committed suicide in 29, but remember the cartoons of brokers jumping out windows, the pictures of former millionaires selling apples on street corners? Okay. We had a huge crash last October, $500 billion of stock value lost, but things didn't fall apart. There may be, of course, another crash that could cripple the economy. Yet what happened in 1929 didn't happen in 1987. It's not automatic. That's the important lesson. We've been liberated from the myth, which is commentary for this evening, Tom. Thank you, John. The Nobel Prize in Physics today was awarded to three Americans for discoveries that helped explain the makeup of the universe. They are Leon Letterman, Melvin Schwartz, and Jack Steinberger. The Nobel Prize in Chemistry went to three West German scientists for unraveling the mystery of photosynthesis, the process of converting sunlight into energy. 